Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Tina Jha. Tuesday marked one year of the Galwan Valley clash in which 20 of our soldiers lost their lives and a number of Chinese troops were also killed. Official numbers suggest five of the Chinese soldiers were killed. That's what the Chinese reports say. In what was the worst clash between the two countries in over 40 years, the Galwan incident reverberated around the world. The casualties in this clash were the first in the disputed Sino-Indian border since 1975. The Galwan episode led to rapid build-up of forces on both sides of the line of actual control. Both sides moved in tanks, missiles and other heavy weaponry closer to the LAC, leading to a very, very tense situation at the border. Following multiple rounds of talks, both at the military and diplomatic levels, an agreement was made on de-escalation and disengagement from all friction points in Ladakh. But months after the process began, the disengagement is not complete yet and the stalemate continues to this day. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyse with experts the present situation at the LAC, what has changed one year since the Galwan incident, India's approach to the Galwan clash, which is being seen as a major punctuation in the bilateral relations between India and China, and what does the future hold for both countries. To discuss these aspects and much more, I'm joined on the program today by two distinguished panelists. I'm pleased to welcome on the program Mr. Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti, former Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, and Lieutenant General Dr. Rakesh Sharma, retired. He's a distinguished fellow at the Center for Land Warfare Studies. Thank you to both my guests for joining me on the program today. Lieutenant General, allow me to begin the program with you. In fact, let's first get a sense of the present situation in Ladakh, which are the friction points where disengagement is yet to happen? Uh, thank you, um, uh, Tina. Uh, firstly, let me pay homage to 20 of our brave martyrs who, who uh, gave supreme sacrifice exactly one year ago uh, for the motherland. Having said that, um, uh, if you follow what the Chinese carried out last year uh, from the month of May onwards, it is apparent that they were only focused towards Aksai Chin. They did not focus themselves to the central sector or the eastern sector. Even the southern areas of uh, eastern Ladakh were not so touched. So when we talk about the areas of Aksai Chin, they uh, commence from Karakoram Pass, Depsang Plateau, the Galwan areas, the hot springs, uh, the Pigongso, both sides, and north and south, and of course the areas of Kailash Range. Now, after the 10th round of talks, the disengagement that has taken place uh, where troops were face-to-face -face, and including the tanks were face-to-face -face, in a very tense situation on Kailash Range, uh, I think uh, that has been uh, disengaged and the troops have fallen back towards their own areas. The PLA troops have gone back to Rudok, which is a cantonment for them in, in the areas of uh, on the G219 highway. Now, if you follow what has happened, uh, right from the time Galwan happened, there was always a desire to create a buffer zone between uh, both sides. Mm -hmm. So Galwan, in, after 15th of June last year, uh, the forces decided to move two kilometers away from each other. So about a three, four kilometers gap was created in Galwan, a kind of buffer zone where no patrolling was allowed. A similarly thing has happened in, uh, in Gogra, a little lesser distance, and also on Depsang. You know, Depsang is a problematic situation for quite some time. Uh, however, Chinese are demanding areas on up to 19, of their 1959 line up to the areas of Bursa, which is well down on own side of the uh, broken country in Depsang. And uh, we were uh, patrolling up to patrol point 13. So in between these two areas, on the Raki Nala, which is the access to Depsang Plateau, and the area of bottleneck, a kind of buffer has been created they, uh, the Chinese troops are two kilometers on the towards the Depsang side, and we are two kilometers towards the Butse side. So a buffer has been created there. And after the disengagement has taken place in the in on um, north bank of Pegongso, another buffer came up uh, where a moratorium of patrolling was laid down between Finger Four and Finger Eight, about eight odd kilometers. And uh, after the disengagement on Kailash Range, the Chinese withdrew backwards uh, towards Rudok. We have moved own side towards Chushul. So if we follow this through on the entire area of Aksai Chin where the problematic situation that occurred or what is being spoken as friction points, a kind of buffer has been created where there is no patrolling being carried out by either side. 
Okay. It also implies that there is a, you know, uh, that since there is a trust deficit, uh, both sides are monitoring this area of so-called buffer from Depsang down to Kailash range and maintaining a distance so that nobody comes and infringes the, this moratorium. So that's where uh, uneasy, a tense peace remains. But uh, since the disengagement have taken place, uh, there has been no instance of any transgressions or any uh, infringement having been carried out. Tina? Okay, Ambassador. So, uh, uh, stalemate persists in several areas. Uh, as uh, the Lieutenant General has pointed out, there are areas like Gogra, Hot Springs, the Depsang Plains. And according to news reports, these are areas from where, uh, for a disengagement process, China has been inflexible to this suggestion as of now. Does that indicate that the talks held so far, the several round of talks that have taken place, have broken down and a fresh start would be needed going ahead for a complete disengagement as per uh, uh, the agreement between both India and China? Well, one thing about China, we must all remember that nothing happens you know, quickly. Uh, particularly in contested areas like the border. I mean, we all remember what happened in Sundaram Cho and how long it took. I believe it was almost seven years before they actually uh, pulled back uh, from there. So I am not expecting anything quick. So in fact, the Chinese will play this out and it will, uh, it will, they will try to link it to other things. There is an overall uh, macro, uh, macro sort of geopolitical situation that has grown particularly with the pandemic, the quad, and now the G7 declaration. So you are, you are looking at a situation which, is, which, has, which has now developed more linkages, not just in simply the, the, the border kind of uh, provocation or whatever uh, we might call it. Now, there has been a lot of theories about why it was done, why China decided to do it. One of it was that better infrastructure on our side. Uh, they, they found that perhaps it might be easier to deploy, to do some forward deployment so that when India moves up, uh, they're already there, you know, to, to sort of uh, to, to sort of deal with the situation. Or So I think these are several issues. But overall, I think, I think the geopolitical issue is also very important, okay. uh, which is like, uh, which is what I mentioned, the movement of the Quad, India, US, uh, you know, the Malabar exercises, the poor nation, Australia joining in, and then the G7 and the pandemic. I mean, one of the main things is the pandemic, the growing demand for investigation into the lab leak theory, which seems from circumstantial evidence to be perhaps the correct uh, sort of assessment that it did leak from the lab. It is now clear that the virus is not a natural one. The gain of function, etc. research that was being done was making it a more hospitable to human hosts, etc. Now, now this is uh, putting some pressure, and there are indications that the Chinese CCP, while uh, President Xi was addressing Chinese CCP, he simply he has now telling his uh, you know countrymen and those who are in positions, uh, official positions, that that China should project the image of being a nice country, uh, that people should love China, etc. This is very different from the earlier instruction, though we don't know whether it was actually given, uh, of the wolf warrior diplomacy that we have seen, seen. Chinese diplomats being rude, China being pushing its way around, saying rude things to various countries. And of course, uh, so all this taken together shows that the situation is fairly complex and it is very unlikely that we will see the status quo restored very quickly. But one thing, to... one thing, Ambassador, what what has happened over the past one year is that since the Galwan incident, of course, the dynamics of India-China relationship have changed in several ways. How do you see the Galwan clash instituting a new direction in Indian foreign policy in the manner of how we responded in terms of how we've been able to withstand Chinese aggression over the past one year? Look, I think that there is definitely a reassessment and I think it's very clear from what EAM, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar has been saying, and what uh, the government has been saying, that it cannot be a business as usual, that China broke all the agreements that we had, that, uh, that, you know, that peace and tranquility will be maintained at the border. So China cannot expect, though China thinks that, oh, this is something legacy of history, and you know, they have a very trite kind of a statement that they, that they put out that, you know, leave it aside, we will, 
have otherwise good relations, you know, leave the border aside. That's not going to happen. I think the border, uh, border has gone beyond that red line where it is going to impact on our bilateral ties. How it will impact, we have seen some actions being taken by the government. You know, 5G in sensitive areas, Chinese companies will be shut out. Then, of course, the apps being banned, etc. So we are also going to be choosy about what we do in terms of we are going to use the tools that are beneficial to us, not that, that those that harm us. But again, there are little, little, little indications that we are willing to reconsider some of those things uh, about, uh, about, let's say, the telecom industry, where, where a new notice has come out saying that, that uh, the government will not object to tie-ups with foreign companies, uh, those who have borders with India, companies in countries who have borders with India. In other words, that private companies can have some kind of tie-up. So there is a bit of you know, uh, flexibility there being given. Now, obviously, this is, uh, this is something that we are going to assess from our own national interest point of view. Take the economic uh, and the trade aspect, for example. I mean, the trade apparently has now more or less stabilized and in fact gone up as compared to last year yes. in the first uh, three, four months of this year. So clearly trade is, uh, is, is okay in the sense that it's not spectacularly gone up, but it's stabilizing at a certain point, maybe less than what we had before. But and this is one area that that where we must uh, be, look for more ways to reduce our dependence on the Chinese imports. Certainly, I'll come back to you and understand what the future holds for both these countries. But from the perspective of national security, Lieutenant General, if I may ask you, what has changed in the one year post Galwan? How has it helped India strengthen itself to take on any kind of eventuality, any kind of security threat, if we say? Okay, uh, the fact of the matter is that last year was a great clarify, clarifying moment for us. You know, uh, 30 years we have carried out a relationship with China which was based on joint working groups, on based on uh, um, special representative talks, five agreements uh, and, and the protocols and the CBMs that were laid down. So despite what happened in 2013 or 2014 and 2017, there was still a kind of a bonhomme and we were lulled into some uh, kind of com complacency. So there has been a great clarifying moment which came in May, May last year, which is clarified that China means business uh, and a business of the nasty kind. If we follow what Chinese have been doing on the Tibetan plateau in the course of um, some time and what uh, the statements have been made in last six months. There were five major ra uh, um, uh, trains which are going to end up at Shigatse and Lhasa. There were five major highways being built there and a very large number of uh, state roads being constructed in Tibet. There is a rehabilitation of two and a half lakh people in 264, or, uh, sorry, 672 camps sorry, small, small villages all along the border. So there is a demographic change which has been propelled in just in the course of last couple of years. So what he means business in Tibet means business for us and we need to be cautious of the fact. Second is the issue of what we did uh, in matters of uh, economics. Now, see, uh, we were able to curb the investment, but we were not able to curb the trade. We have the largest trade in 2020 with China, more than United States, $77 billion trade we did, we did with China. United States was only 75. And if you follow the trend, it's very difficult to decouple the trade part of it. It may be easy to stop investment, say Huawei and all that. So there is a, uh, there is, we cannot go back to history and say things are, so the protocols have died, the CBMs have died. Uh, the, the agreements do not stand uh, on their own feet because there is a trust deficit. That's why the buffers have been created and there are no patrolling being carried out. So there is a transformation here. And you know, I, would, uh, I would also state in the end here that there are 120 odd countries which have maximum trade with China. You know, they are beholden to China because of the kind of investment being done by China in 120 countries of the world, 26 if I'm not wrong. So there is a the, 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 what he wants to be nice, G, but what he is doing is not so very nice. We need to be cautious of the fact that there is the, a change, China, a change attitude of China. It is, it may or may not be expansionist more than what it has achieved. But then we have to be cautious of the fact that something can go wrong tomorrow. 
Okay, okay. So while India has so far confronted China with its full might at the LSE we've seen over the past one year, what kind of support is it getting from its allies, the Quad partners, and also the G7 on, on, on countering China's hegemony? Well, the world has already reacted. In fact, if you look at the G7 statement and the American statements, it is clear, and also now the Europeans and NATO statements. I think it's quite clear that they are they are going to, if not, um, I mean, they are going. They are already identifying China uh, as a as a as not a benign competitor, but a malign competitor in the sense that China does have. Uh, its hegemonic aspirations, while trade on the one hand is okay, and uh, of course decoupling etc. has been talked about, and it's not easy. The Atmanirbhar concept is partly because of that. But I think what China has been trying to achieve through its economic uh, investments, like the BRI etc., certainly has strategic objectives, like cornering precious metals, uh, cornering mines, etc., which is needed for, let's say, the, the new digital sort of, uh, you know, requirements, uh, you know, things like lithium and titanium, all these precious metals that are required for a high-tech economy and producing chips, etc. So I think there is a pushback growing, which has grown. And I think because of the European now engagement in Indo-Pacific, uh, things are now falling into place a bit in the sense that China is probably seeing the world slowly because these are democracies. There's a lot of debate, unlike China, which is a top-down presidency, gives the order and everybody says, uh, falls in line and says, yes, sir. And uh, But this, democracies take time to, to organize themselves because of debate, internal. There are so many voices within a democracy. But I think that is now happening. And I think what happens is that when democracies do finish their debate and reach conclusions, those are very long term in nature because a dictator can be replaced and can change policies uh, the next day. But democracies don't do that. They have a long term goals. They discuss these things. So I think today China will be facing, for example, the demand for investigation into the Wuhan lab leak is going to grow and everybody is going to clamor for it. And that is that is an image which China cannot live down, even if they protest and don't allow the investigation. But everybody is now quite sure that it was the Wuhan lab leak, whether deliberate or whether accidental, we do not know. And that is what people want to know. And I think the G7 is already talking about a pandemic uh, related, uh, you know, you know, global kind of a, a paradigm that they wish to create so that this doesn't happen again. And the okay. vaccination okay. policy. So I think there is a situation growing in which China is going to feel a little bit of a certain amount of pressure from the rest of the world, which is now uh, taking a fresh look at what China has done. Okay, Lieutenant General, so uh, several countries are indeed sending out loud messages as far as uh, China's aggressive designs are concerned. But how challenging will it be for India, the other blocs like the G7, the Quad, to counter China's growing push, multi-sectoral push, if I may put it that way, across the globe. Because uh, in, in, the ambassador just pointed out that Ch China is growing uh, uh, space in about more than 100 countries worldwide. So how challenging is that going to be to counter China's uh, infra push and in other sectors as well? Okay, finally, uh, you know, despite that the G7 is a powerful grouping, all nations work on their national interests. United States, you know, if the Apple phone gets so much of money for United States Exchequer, Apple phone is actually finally manufactured in China. And uh, so are major components or major uh, items being produced in China, which just cannot be the gold, the, um, the value chains cannot be just delinked. United States has a trade of over $550 billion with China. Even Japan, you know, they are the other quad countries, Japan is $350 billion. And uh, the Australians are $150 billion. So while uh, uh, there is a uh, G7 grouping and NATO countries have made a uh, make big noise about it, look at the trade which China has with, uh, with Germany. It's astronomical. There are 12,000 trains that traveled last year from China to, to uh, Duisburg in Germany. 
only uh, between city to city and nothing else can be loaded in, in between. Look at the kind of trade going between Germany and um, China is astronomical. So the fact is that finally all countries will come back and do work which is for their own national interest. Absolutely. Despite NATO making the right noise, NATO did say that, you know, we are willing to work because of bringing out our economies back from this slumber there. So there were also consolidatory noises being made by NATO. Finally, the countries do look forward to their own uh, national economies to be rejuvenated. So why, you know, why all this is happening and people are conscious of the fact that the China is expansionist, China has got uh, hegemonistic tendencies. But despite that, we have to work to our own ends. Finally, it is India and India has to, you know, allies matter tremendously. We need to change and create allies for ourselves. But we also have to stand on our own feet in all other measures, in socioeconomic development, in national security issues, in, uh, uh, in economic issues. We have to get on with our own national um, upliftment. Certainly. And at, at the moment, as, as our government has been putting across India's relations with China are at a crossroad, there is trust deficit. And for the past one year, there have been several steps that have been taken to reduce dependence on Chinese imports as well. But Ambassador, looking, talking about the future trajectory of ties between India and China, how do you look at it? Well, I see um, the trade decoupling uh, not really happening because... Uh, the supply chains are very difficult, but some amount of economic disengagement is going to take place, in, particularly when in sectors that we have identified as sensitive, you know, things like uh, telecom, for example. The other thing that will happen alongside will be a hedging policy, which is basically the Quad, uh, the G7 initiatives, the European you know, initiatives, which is a kind of signaling and also kind of... Uh, kind of sending a signal of deterrence to China in the sense that if, 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 you, if China continues with these expansionist and aggressive uh, practices and policies, then there will be further upgrading of the Quad. There will be further upgrading of these, of these uh, associations that are building up in terms of their... And so this is the kind of messaging that is being done. And particularly the U USA will be a very important player because it is a global power. It has the ability to project power, uh, for example, in the South China Sea and, and almost everywhere along uh, 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 across the globe. So I think you are already seeing uh, the US uh, you know, Navy operating in and around Taiwan in the South China Sea, uh, doing phone ops, for example, which is the freedom of operation, uh, freedom of navigation operations with clearly signaling to, to China that, uh, that, you know, there is a limit to which they can, they can. China is also, I think, I think testing that how far they can go. Yes. Uh, that, and because the f further they can go, uh, it's advantages to them. So I think they are also testing the waters, but there is a pushback building up. The world has realized that China is, uh, is not a benign actor uh, in the international stage. And is, and is clearly interested in capturing the number one spot, displacing the USA. China, for example, would be very happy if the USA kept away from Asia so that it can uh, be the Middle Kingdom and it, with everybody sort of saying, uh, you know, play, paying tribute to China as the, as the leader of the, at least the, in Asia. But that's not going to happen. I don't think countries are prepared to accept that. But there will be adjustments made and in the process, uh, the power equations are going to change. But finally, I think India has to put her own house in order. That is Certainly. The, that and is since the... national interest is paramount, left in general, given the distrust with China, is increased militarization of the LAC the new strategic reality? Will both India and China have to contend with this new reality, that of a heavier military posture in Ladakh? Okay, I uh, would say that we have to now create new doctrines, new thought processes. You know, uh, it is not um, uh, past tense which will go on future. So whether we want deterrence by denial or we are thinking about some kind of infliction of punishment, how are we going to handle the issues of cyber or electromagnetic spectrum and space wars? If the Chinese, uh, if the New York Times says that 
or the Alexity in Bombay was switched off in October last year uh, by a cyber attack. And what cyber attacks are happening in in uh, in, in uh, ransomware, which is being used in the United States. We have to actually get down to fighting on the borders, yes, but also think about warfare, which is transcendent to new different uh, technological dimensions, which may not even include the borders. So I think we need to re uh, recreate our strategy for future in five years, 10 years, and in longer time frame. Absolutely. And I think the, primarily the future course of our ties will depend if the ball, in fact, is in China's court at the moment on whether Beijing will adhere to the pacts, which are uh, first and foremost aimed at ensuring peace on the border with India. So that, of course, remains to be seen whether a new round of ta talks will have to be held or uh, China will agree to disengage on all the friction points as was agreed in the earlier meetings. So with that, I'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you once again to both my guests for joining me on the program and putting into perspective things relating to India and China post Galwan for us and our viewers. Pleasure having you on the show. So that's it from us on the program today. Thanks very much for your time.